Amen. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. The Apostle Paul said, And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless. He says, Then all of our faith is useless. And we apostles would be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, he says it again, then your faith is useless and you are guilty of your sins. But the good news is this morning, we know Christ has been raised. Amen. Jesus is alive. In fact, tap somebody and say, Jesus is alive. And he's here today to make us brand new. Without a resurrection, our message is useless. Without a resurrection, then we shouldn't even be having the service. Without a resurrection, there would be no reason to gather. Without a resurrection, we wouldn't sing songs today. Without a resurrection, I wouldn't be up here preaching. Without a resurrection, we'd be guilty. Aren't you glad we're not? The blood of Jesus today is good enough. So I'm going to give you four reasons why the resurrection is true. Now, um, there's a great book called Another Gospel by an author named Elisa Childers. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's coming to Revival Town Podcast in July. We're really excited about this. And she sent on a blog this week, and she gave four reasons why the resurrection is true. And when I saw those, I said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack those in great detail this weekend. And there's so many more reasons, but I'm going to give you four today. So you can be on the lookout for that. She's coming on the podcast that is hosted by Andy King and I to talk about a new book that's coming out. But her book, Another Gospel, is the inspiration for another series that we're getting ready to start in three weeks. All right, now next week we're going to do a series called Belief. Everybody say Belief. It's important for us as believers to know what we believe. We launched a new website a couple days ago at rcpra.org, and there is a beliefs page. And during our beliefs series, we're going to unpack what it is we believe. Because I, I know that as followers of Jesus, it's not enough to tell somebody that you believe in God. You need to know what you believe. You need to know why you believe it. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, well, let's go to this. Point number one, Jesus died by Roman crucifixion. Four reasons why we know the resurrection is true is because it's a historical fact that Jesus died on the cross. This is not disputed. It's part of history. So anyone who says otherwise is incorrect. Now, people have been arguing whether or not Jesus is risen for centuries, But it can't be argued that Jesus showed up on this earth and he died by Roman crucifixion. In fact, a few weeks ago, I I did this little TikTok video, and if if you're on there, that's kind of my jam, where I do a scripture of the day, one to three minutes every single day. I've been doing it today's day 104, all right? Now, I had somebody push back, and I was sharing some of the reasons why I believe the Bible is true. And someone simply wrote, Jesus is a myth. And I said, well, you know, that's, that's, that might be your opinion, all right? But to say Jesus is a myth is like saying Abraham Lincoln is a myth, right? I mean, if I got up here this morning and I told you, I just want everybody to know Abraham Lincoln is a myth, all right? Now, don't edit this video later and make it look like I'm really saying this, all right? <laughs> but if I did say that and I said, I don't care what you learned In your history books, I don't care what you were told in school, Abraham Lincoln is a myth. I don't care that you've been to Lincoln. I don't care that you've been to Springfield. I don't care that you've been in the museum and you took the tour and you saw where he supposedly lived. Abraham Lincoln is a myth. Now, if I said that today, you would leave going, you know what, worship was pretty cool. I enjoyed the band, but the pastor's an idiot. (laughs) Right? Because it's a historical fact that Abraham Lincoln lived. It's a historical fact that Jesus lived, and it's a historical fact that he was crucified on a cross. And what's so powerful about this historical fact is that it was prophesied before it ever happened. It was written 
more than a thousand years before it happened, that Jesus would be pierced. And then archaeologists, they, they dug up manuscripts that we have. We have more manuscripts for the Bible than any book in history. There are more archaeological discoveries for the Bible than any book in history. We have archaeological evidence, we have historical evidence, we have scientific evidence, we have circumstantial evidence, and then we have these prophecies. And there's more, than, there's more than just the ones I'm sharing. There are numerous prophecies that were fulfilled in the birth, in the life, in the ministry, in the miracles, in the death, in the resurrection of Jesus. So we go back before he was crucified. And what's so powerful about this is it was prophesied in Scripture that Jesus would die on a cross before crucifixion was invented. How about that? Let's take a look. Psalm chapter 22, verse 16. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves, and they throw dice for my clothing. And we're going to find out in the Gospel of John that's exactly what happened. But not only was it written down in the book of Psalms, it was also prophesied by the prophet Zechariah that Jesus would be pierced. Isaiah 53, 5. Even Isaiah prophesied that he would be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. By his stripes we are healed. Amen? Amen. It was written. It was prophesied. It was foretold. And it came to pass when Jesus showed up. John chapter 19, verse 24. So they said, rather than tearing apart Let's throw dice for it, his clothing. This fulfilled the scripture. The scripture, how do we get it? Archaeologists dug it up. They dated it. We have it. Historical documents, even by historians who don't believe Jesus was raised. Even those who don't put their faith in Jesus do not dispute the historical accounts of scripture. It says, they divided my garments among themselves and they threw dice for my clothing. Psalms 22.1. It says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far away when I groan for help? This was written in the book of Psalms, and that's exactly what Jesus said when he hung on the cross on Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. About 3 o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you forsaken me? Why to believe? Why do we believe the Bible is true? Why do we believe that Jesus is like one? We can look at the crucifixion, the historical context of the crucifixion. Number two, James, the half brother of Jesus, he was skeptical. James, he was converted after an encounter with the risen Jesus. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in this room, you have a brother? Just raise your hand. You have a brother, right? All right, that's a lot. A lot of you have brothers. What would it take today for you to be convinced that your brother was God? Right? So now you know why James wasn't too convinced. What would it take? It would take you watching him die, and then three days later he came and visited you. Right? That's what it would take. And that's what happened. With James, let me go back. Mark chapter 3, verse 21. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. They tried to take Jesus away. James said, he's out of his mind, right? James did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. Galatians chapter 1, verse 18, Paul says, three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter. This was after Paul's conversion. And I stayed with him for 15 days. The only other apostle I met at the time was James, the Lord's brother. So we know James, he went from not believing to being a leading figure in the early church. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 7 says, Then Jesus was seen by James, and then later all the apostles. See, after Jesus came out of the grave, he appeared not only to his disciples, but he appeared to other eyewitnesses. In fact, the Gospels were written by eyewitnesses, eyewitness accounts. And it was recorded that at one time, 500 people saw him. So I want you to know, no one hallucinated, thinking they saw Jesus, because groups of people don't have the same hallucination, right? 
If any of you tried to leave today and say, you know what, I, I was at Rock Church Easter today. Um, Chuck Tate's the pastor. He was there. And then maybe you spoke up and said, um, no, he wasn't there. And the other, some other people were gathered around and said, no, no, we, we, we all saw him, right? You know, one person can hallucinate, but everybody else would know, no, that, that's, he, he, he was there, right? So we know that when Jesus was seen by these eyewitnesses, it was a big deal, all right? It's credible. But not only did he appear to these other eyewitnesses and to his disciples, it says that he appeared to James, a private encounter. See, James, the half-brother of Jesus, had a private encounter with Jesus after Jesus was raised. So James, he went from not following Jesus, from not believing Jesus was the Messiah, to being a leading figure in the early church. Everybody say, made new. You see, when you have an encounter with Jesus, it changes you. You don't have to change anything to come to him, but after you come to him, you won't be the same. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, right? The way, the old way we used to live is gone. We become made new. That's what this service is about, being made to, made new, having an encounter with Jesus so we can leave transformed. And not only did he do it to the disciples, not only did he do it to James, but even Paul, who used to be Saul. Paul went from being a persecutor of the church who was suddenly converted after testifying to having met a resurrected Jesus. So this is number three. We have a guy that was out to destroy the church who ended up planting churches, writing almost half of the New Testament. How was that possible? Because he had an encounter with Jesus. Has anybody here, you had an encounter with Jesus. Nobody can tell you that he's not real. It doesn't matter what people throw in your face because you've experienced him. You've had an encounter with him. Everybody I know is one encounter with Jesus away from a different life. Everyone in this room, everyone watching, every family member, every friend, don't you ever give up on anybody. It doesn't matter how old they are. Everyone is one encounter with Jesus away from a different life. Somebody say, made new. Number four. Jesus' closest followers believed they saw him alive after he was dead, and they were willing to suffer and die without recanting their testimony. Here's what's amazing about the life of the disciples. When Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, they all split. They were with him for three years and even in the most crucial moment of his lifetime, when he was in the garden sweating drops of blood, they had just left the Last Supper where he broke bread and he said, this is my body, this is my blood. They didn't get it. They sang a hymn together. Judas left to go get everyone so he could betray him. Jesus asked the disciples to pray. They kept falling asleep. Then Judas showed up, kissed him on the cheek, betrayed him. And Jesus was led away, and they all left. Even Peter denied him three times after telling Jesus he wouldn't. So how do you explain the disciples going from being afraid and on the run and watching from a distance to every single one of them being martyred because they refused to recant the testimony that they saw Jesus alive after he was dead? Because it was true. It was true. Every single one was martyred except for John. He was boiled alive and survived. Peter went from denying Jesus three times, cursing out a young girl, to after spending 40 days with Jesus post-resurrection. They were there when Jesus ascended to heaven. He commissioned them. They waited for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit showed up. They received power. Peter, Peter preached the first message. 3,000 people got saved. He became the leader of the church. And the enemy's been trying to stop it ever since, and he's been unsuccessful. Why? Because the gates of hell can't stop the church. 2,000 years later, we're still celebrating the resurrection. We've been made new. And if you haven't, Today is the day to give your life to God through Jesus. Have that encounter with him. 
and he'll make you new. It'll change everything. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, so it's, but it is true. Everybody say, it is true. Right, look at someone next to you and say, it's true. All right? Reminds me of that Seinfeld episode when Jerry was saying, it's not true. Right? No, it is, it is true. Christ has been raised from the dead. Paul saw him. James saw him. The disciples saw him. Eyewitnesses saw him. He was the first one to be raised from the dead, and all those who are in their graves will follow. This gives us hope today. This is why the Apostle Paul says, we are not like those who don't have hope. When somebody dies, there's still hope, right? We know death is not the end. Verse 21 says, death came because of a man, Adam, being raised from the dead, also came because of a man, Christ. Death is not defeat. All men will die as Adam, but all those who belong to Christ, somebody say like me, will be raised to new life. Hashtag made new. We've been made new. You remember when Lazarus died and Jesus showed up and Martha was ticked off? If you would have got hurt sooner, my brother wouldn't die. Do you remember what Jesus said to her? I am the resurrection. I am the life. John 14, 6 says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It doesn't matter who leaves your room as long as Jesus is in the room. There's a story about a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, and his daughter, his 12-year-old girl, died. And Jesus showed up, and he announced to everybody who was at the house that she was just sleeping. And everybody laughed at him. So he kicked him out of the house. But when he walked into the room, everything changed for the little girl. And she came back to life. And today, God has new life for you. If you will invite him into your room, he will change you. He will make you new. We don't always get what we want. Bad things happen to good people. We go through seasons where we lose. We go through seasons where we lose loved ones and we grieve. I know you get weary because I'm a pastor and I get weary. I spent Friday night in the ER with my wife. She's, she's okay, but we've been in a battle for four years. I get weary. That's why I need Jesus. I've experienced loss, but I put my trust in Jesus. My hope, hope has a rope. It's Jesus. I can't make it with Jesus. I could be angry at him, and it won't bring my loved ones back. But if I run to him, he'll sustain me in my suffering because he's close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. 24 years ago, we got a phone call that my father-in-law had a heart attack. Annette and I got in our car. We drove 20 minutes, and we prayed the entire way to the hospital, believing God for a miracle. And we got there. There was a priest waiting for us. He informed us that doctors did everything they could. But unfortunately, they couldn't save him. And she was shattered. My mother-in-law was shattered. We were broken. And we're still practically newlyweds. Two months away from opening the doors of Rock Church for the very first time. In our 20s. Kind of lost. We were really leaning on him. He had served as an elder of a church for years. He had a lot of wisdom. Things didn't go the way we wanted them to, and they didn't go the way we prayed they'd go. And we had to walk that out. And 24 years later, my wife still grieves, but she grieves with hope. Here's what I want to tell you we sing a song, Too Good Not to Believe. Some people say, well, how, how could you guys believe when you prayed and you, you didn't get what you want? Here's my answer. In 24 years since my father-in-law died, we have witnessed miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. We have seen God heal bodies. We have seen him restore. I was in a hospital room when my mom coded. She was in a hospital for seven weeks where she coded multiple times. I was in the hospital when the doctor said, you need to call your family. She's not going to make it. Guess what? She's right there. Don't tell me God's not real. I may have lost somebody, but I've seen him do miracle after miracle. My son was born lifeless, but then he was resuscitated. He suffered a brachial plexus injury where he had no mobility in his right arm. We met with neurosurgeons at the Children's Hospital in St. Louis, and they sent us home with pamphlets to learn how to raise somebody without mobility in one of their limbs, but God healed him. 
Now he dribbles a basketball with his right hand. He shoots with the right hand. He preached and fused last Sunday holding a microphone with his right hand. Don't tell me God can't still do miracles. I've lost people. I haven't got what I've always prayed for. But God is still real. I still see him active and moving in this church and through his people. Water baptisms and salvations and restorations and healings. Amen. He will make you new. He is the hope you need to make it. Because it is a crazy world right now, isn't it? Amen. I want to, I want to show you a painting. This painting is in the Louvre Museum in Paris, France. And this painting is called Checkmate. Everybody say Checkmate. And it is a picture of the devil playing a game of chess against a man who has his hand on his head like this. He's, it's, he's, he looks a little bit desperate. The devil is chuckling because he just defeated this man in chess. True story. There was a tour given at the Louvre that featured some elite athletes and world champions who were invited. And among some of these world champions was a grandmaster world champion chess player. And they began to walk through the Louvre and this tour guide led them from painting to painting to painting. And then they got to this painting, Checkmate. And the tour guide said, this is called Checkmate. Here you have the devil beating this guy at chess. They moved on to the next painting. The world champion chess player did not move on with the group. He stayed and just simply stared at the painting. Finally, somebody in the group realized they're missing somebody. They said, hey, we, we, we lost a guy back there. So the tour guide went back to the painting, and as he walked up, he saw this man just standing there observing the painting. He says, you like this one, don't you? It's called, it's called Checkmate. The, the devil just beat that guy. He goes, you know I'm a world champion chess player. Oh, okay. Yeah, and as a world champion chess player, I see things that not everybody sees. And I, I can see the devil and I can see him smiling. I can, I can see the guy with his hand on the head. But I don't know if anyone's looked at the board. You see, I have a problem with this painting. And the tour guide's eyes got real big. And, uh, uh, you, you do? You have a, a problem with it? Yeah, he goes, you know I'm a world champion chess player. Yeah, yeah, you said that. <laughs> he said, they're either going to have to change the title of the painting. They're going to have to change the name or somebody is going to have to repaint it. And the tour guide said, well, why is that? He said, you know I'm a world-class champion chess player. I'm a grand master. And while you guys moved on, I couldn't help but study the board and observe the board. And what I've come to conclude is this. The king still has one more move. You see, when Jesus was on the cross... And he said, it is finished. The devil thought he won and smirked, but the king still had one more move. Amen? Amen. Can you stand with me? Somebody say, the king still has one more move. The king has one more move over your family, one more move over your marriage. The king has one more move over your kids. It is not finished. Amen? If you are breathing, God is not done. Don't ever give up on anyone. He wants to make you new today. Can you bow your heads and close your eyes? Let me ask you this question. Have you committed your life to Jesus? Have you put your faith in him? I'm not asking you if you believe in God because the devil believes in God. The demons believe in God. They tremble at his name. My question is, have you put your faith in God through Jesus? And if you haven't, today I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to embarrass you. But if you'd say, Chuck, you know what, I, I, man, I, I think I'm a Christian. I'm pretty sure I am. I, if you want to know, 100, be 100% sure that you're going to heaven, that you're going to spend eternity with Jesus, 
Can you just put your head up, put it down? That's all you got to do. Chuck, pray for me. Thank you, thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, thank you. Several people last night, several people at nine. Now more here. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Anybody else? This is why we're here. This is why we do this. I'd like everybody to repeat after me out loud. Everybody say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Today I repent. I give my life to you. I believe you really did die on the cross. I believe you were raised from the grave. And now because of my confession, because of my faith, I am saved. I am born again. I have been made new. In Jesus' name, amen.